Welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm Kat Grant, the Equal Justice Works Fellow at FFRF. I'm coming to you live from the Stephen Yule Friendly Atheist Studio in Freethought Hall, FFRF's office in Madison, Wisconsin. Today on Ask an Atheist, fundamentalism, such a drag. We're talking with royalty, Naomi Dix, one of the most dynamic, versatile, boundary-pushing drag artists in the country. I'm joined today by FFRF's Director of Governmental Affairs, based in Washington, D.C., Mark Dan. How's it going, Mark? Pretty darn good, Kat. So we're very excited for the show, and we'll be taking your questions throughout the show. If you have a question for Naomi, please put it in the comments section, or send us an email at askanatheist at ffrf.org. And before we get into today's topic, we want to recognize the hundreds of viewers that replied to the question from our last week's show with the Southern Poverty Law Center confronting Christian nationalism. We had an astounding response to, the, to our question uh, on a scale of one to 10, how much of a threat do you think Christian nationalism is to the United States and why? And so here are the results. Uh, many of you feel that on a scale of one to 10, it's a nine. So a good reminder for us to be on guard and be ready for any and all threats to the democracy. So thank you so much to all of you for your thoughtful responses. So, um, and we'll see how that, uh, obviously, uh, threat of Christian nationalism is going to definitely be a through line in today's uh, interview with Naomi. So here's today's question. What the heck is wrong with fundamentalists that they actually think drag queens are a threat? Please answer the question in the comments section or send us an email at askanatheist at ffrf.org. Please be sure to keep your answers family friendly and we might read it on the air. So turning today's topic, in December of 2022, Naomi was hosting a drag show in Southern Pines located in Moore County in North Carolina. Um, it's part of Sandhills Pride, which is a region in North Carolina. Then local Christian school leaders, administrators, and white supremacist groups urged parents to contact the town council, the theater uh, where the event was being held, the show sponsors to ask for the event to be canceled. Naomi and her team were subjected to death threats and harassment. During the show, there was a power outage in Moore County that threatened the show. We'll talk with Naomi about confronting the far right, how she rallied the community, the anti-drag uh, performer bills that are advancing across the country, and how Naomi, and then Naomi will give uh, some fashion advice to some of America's leading Christian nationalists. Mer uh, Naomi can be found on Instagram at Naomi Dix underscore H dot O dot C. Uh, so Naomi, welcome, and it is fan uh, wonderful, uh, a fantastic uh, that we're having you here today, and wonderful way to end Pride Month. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. And remember, FFRF is a 501c3 nonpartisan organization, so we do not and cannot take sides in partisan elections and don't endorse any, uh, necessarily endorse any such views that might be expressed here. Uh, before we get into happened, uh, what happened um, during Pride and the significance of the event, we have a news clip from ABC, uh, 11 ABC out of Raleigh, Durham. Investigators are also looking into whether the attack on the two substations could be related to protests over a local drag show Saturday night. Permitted protesters were outside the Sunrise Theater ahead of that show set for 7 o'clock Saturday evening. Supporters were also there. The headliner of the drag show, Naomi Dick, says she was aware of the complaints and the calls on local leaders to cancel the performance. There was a lot of security stepped up that night as well. The show was a fundraiser for the Sand Hills Pride, the local nonprofit supporting the LGBTQ community. Community. And when power was lost, the audience, as you see here, used cell phones to light up the room so it could continue. Dick says she decided to end the show early, though, for everyone's safety, calling this incident a tactic to silence and scare the community. This is nothing new to the community or the queer community um, in general. We have been dealing with this for years. If this is, in fact, something that will target or is targeting the queer community, what I say to my own community and its allies is that this is literally a uh, hidden agenda um, in order to scare us and to make us feel threatened so that we can be silenced. This is not a moment to silence yourself. Right. Uh, so before we get into the story, can you tell us a little bit about Southern Pines and what their pride celebrations are normally like? Most definitely. So um, Southern Pines is a town that is located in Moore County. Um, it is a pretty conservative area. Um, and 
Southern Pine specifically is a more white conservative area. Um, there are a lot of people that live in that area who are currently serving um, in the Army or um, in the military, Marine Corps, um, or who have retired from the military. Um, so it is very conservative. Um, there isn't a lot of representation when it comes to queerness or transness or the education of queerness and transness there. Um, so Sam Hills Pride <laughs> um, was an or or is an organization, nonprofit, and Pride um, board, I should say, um, that started more recently. Um, it was through a contact that I had in Southern Pines, who is a native of Southern Pines and also used to sit on the board um, as director of Sand Hills Pride, um, who reached out to me back in 2021 to start doing drag shows and drag events there because they had virtually never had that before. Um, and to really bring education and queerness to that space and representation as well. Fantastic. So, Naomi, I think what a lot of us want to know just right off the bat is what was going through your mind when the lights went out at your show and you received all of these numerous death threats and all of these protests in the buildup to the show? Yeah, most definitely. So I kind of want to go back, um, start back with Mark's um, question a little bit and then move into this question, this current question that you have for me. Um, so the atmosphere of the um, community in Southern Pines is a, a beautiful atmosphere. It's a very quaint town. Um, again, this is in North Carolina, so it's a Southern place. Um, it's very small. Community is very small there. Um, there are a lot of people who are retired that moved to that space. There are also just a lot of people who are business owners, local business owners, who are very supportive of their um, town and are supportive of each other. Um, but again, there was the unknown of there being such a large and robust um, community of trans people and queer people living in that area. It wasn't until I started doing shows there um, and creating and facilitating that safe space for community that we started to see um, that my outreach um, had so much response with queer people and people who were queer but never really wanted to be out because they just didn't have that representation. Um, and so through the shows and through my facilitation of not just shows but education to, to the queer community about what pride is about, what queerness is about, what transness is about, and to help the community see the foundation that came before them in order for them to be able to be in this safe space together. It wasn't until then that we started to see so many youth and their parents um, come to these events and these educational events that I was uh, working with San Hills Pride on producing and um, facilitating um, where they felt comfortable with coming out as who they really were and to be open and visible when it came to their journey. Um, so then moving into the question that you have for me about what I was thinking during that time of when the lights went out, um, I did an interview a couple of weeks ago, um, with a local, uh, radio station, The Hill, where we talked about, um, you know, what does that feel like in that moment? Um, or what did I feel like in that moment when the lights went out? And I likened it to being a parent, um, when you're a parent of children or when you are a, um, or when you have some sort of, you know, someone in, in, in your midst that you are um, concerned for or love, um, when you're in a car with a child, um, when you come to an abrupt stop, one of the first things that you do is you put your hand up or your arm up over their chest to protect them um, because they come before you. And so it was the same thing when the lights went out um, in the Sunrise Theater for me. You know, this was a community that I had grown to love and be a part of. Um, and as a drag artist, we have a responsibility to really care for our community because when it really comes to who is the foundation to the queer community, it's first the trans, black, brown, and indigenous community that is at the forefront of the fight and the foundation to the queer community, but it's also the drag performers and the drag artists as well. And so I felt a sense of responsibility in that moment to not really think of myself, 
but to think about the community, their safety, but also the representation that I was showing them and to continuously be that example. And the way that I was that example was by going out onto stage, addressing them, calming them, speaking with every single person in the theater privately as the lights were out, and then asking them to take out their cell phones to illuminate the room so that we could show that despite what was going on, and even though we didn't know what was going on, it was the unknown, that we are a mighty force and that this force will not be silenced and asking them to sing along to Halo so that our voices could be heard. Fantastic. Fantastic. And um, one, one of the people who played a significant role in the agitation before the event was Emily Grace Rainey, according to numerous news reports. Uh, we have a picture of her from the Dallas Voice, and I think Bruce will be putting that up. And according to other news reports from CBS, Grace Rainey also played a role in the January 6th attack and led 100 members uh, from uh, 100 uh, folks from Moore County, um, uh, Four County, uh, uh, to, uh, from Moore County to the January 6th uh, riots. Uh, she has since resigned from her position at Fort Bragg, now named Fort Liberty. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the role? Yeah, most definitely. So I want to be very clear. Emily Grace Rainey, and I think it's very, by the way, just as a disclaimer, I think it's super important that we're honest about these things right now because we're in a time right now specific, specifically with the political climate where we're seeing news stations and we're seeing um, articles that are being done that are not being super direct about what these attacks are and the people that are responsible or hold responsibility when it comes to these things and these attacks and this hatred that is being geared towards the queer and trans community. So with that said, I want to be very clear about who Emily Grace Rainey is. Emily Grace Rainey is by definition, a white supremacist. And I think that this has been proven many, many times with the homework and a lot of the um, uh, just investigation that has been done around her. Um, she may say that she's not, and she may not want to claim that, but she is by definition a white supremacist. Um, and she mm -hmm. is, um, she, she does belong to certain organization and organizations and groups that are looked at as being terrorists within our country. Um, and I'm not going to get into the groups that she belongs to. You can go ahead and look that up. They're available, um, on the wonderful world of Google. Um, but <laughs> When it came to me specifically, um, one of the things that um, she started with were just very small messages here and there of really rallying her troops, I guess you could say, um, no pun intended there, but her troops where she was getting them to um, slowly but surely harass the community, um, specifically the Southern Pines community. I think it's also important to uh, note, it, note that she does not live in Moore County and she does not live in Southern Pine. She lives right outside of Moore County. Um, but through these tactics and these social media tactics and sending out messages and almost like, um, you know, messages of, of maybe say something to the theater that is holding this event. Maybe let's go ahead and put out some pictures and graphics of these performers. Let's go ahead and let's go through these, um, the social medias, uh, the social media accounts of Naomi Dix and cherry pick certain videos um, and, and performances that I were, what was doing at adult specific shows and gather mm -hmm. them together put them in a montage so that people can see that, you know, this is something that you don't want your children to be around and that this is inappropriate for children. So that was one tactic on Emily Grace's um, side. Um, when it came to the Christian school that sent out a letter to their um, children's parents, the, the, the parents of the children that go to the school and even parents that don't go, parents' children that don't go to that school, when they sent out that letter, um, it was just another tactic on people such as Emily Grace Rainey and and the people within power within that school to really um, put myself and the queer community on this chopping block of saying, listen, you know, these are adult performers and we don't want them uh, performing for our children. Um, and I think it's really important to also understand that this was a this was a Christian school. This was a Christian mm -hmm. school that was grooming 
their community um, by using footage that was obviously inappropriate, but footage that was from a show or from shows that it specifically was for adults 21 and up. So right. it's interesting to me that in these instances that, you know, these groups like to kind of cherry pick certain performances <laughs> and use that against us to really push the narrative that we are adult performers. But if that's the case, then you shouldn't be taking your children to Disney World. If that's the case, you shouldn't maybe have children because you're an adult yourself and I'm not telling you what you should do um, or what you should watch on television while you have a child in your home. And to be completely honest, in order to have that child, you had to have intercourse. So maybe you shouldn't have a child. You know, there's there, there's so many different things that we can think about. Um, and this yeah. just goes to show their stupidity when it comes to trying to push a narrative about us as performers. And cherry picking, being hypocrites, um, I mean, very much out of the Christian nationalist white supremacist playbook uh, that we've seen in many, many iterations, numerous times throughout our country's history. So uh, and false narratives around people to uh, describe whatever it is that they want to do. So um, we have another picture of Grace Rainey with the Moore County Sheriff Ronnie Fields, who investigated the attack on the pride. And here they are, uh, here they uh, are together. And uh, this is at a Back the Blue event. Uh, so you can kind of see where a lot of this is going. And according to The Independent, when Sheriff Fields went to investigate uh, Grace Rainey, he said, uh, we, uh, we had to go interview this young lady. This is what he said. We had to go interview this long, long, young lady and we have a word of prayer with her, but it turned out to be false. So do you buy this? Do I buy what? Do you buy that um, there was a thorough investigation? Do you buy that all they had to do was pray about the incident and uh, clearly uh, Grace Rainey had nothing to do with it? Uh, do you buy what the sheriff was saying? So, number one, um, I think that this is a perfect, perfect example of what happens when we as a community allow people to be within power and to misuse the power that they have. Um, when it comes to the sheriff, um, in that instant, I think that he was a disappointment not only to his community, but I think that he was a disappointment to um, just the human race. Um, this mm. is a great example that we see of a good old boy living in the South who has had multiple issues when it comes to being a part of or connected to organizations that are white supremacist organizations. Again, I'm not going to go down the wormhole of that. You can look up those things up that are of public um, viewing on the wonderful world of Google. Um, when it comes to the words that he had during that press conference um, of him going to the home, I believe one of the things that he said was that young lady, Emily Grace Rainey. Um, I think, again, that was just an example of white privilege. I think it was an example of, again, someone being in power and misusing that power to um, uh paint or create a narrative to, of someone who is a is a fellow white person that they are not the problem um, and that they are a Christian um, and they are a Christian woman. Um, I think as far as what my ideas are around or surrounding whether I believe him or not, um, I don't know him to not believe him. Um, I don't care to know him. Um, but I will say that I think that his history and I think that certain things that will probably come out about him later on when it comes to the people who are actually doing the work on the ground and investigating this uh, problem and investigating this instance, um, I will say this, is that the easiest way to find out information about people is by looking at their finances and also looking at finances of organizations that they support. So perhaps you should go ahead and... Uh, maybe be concerned about some of those finances. Wise words. So in the kind of midst of this investigation, do you think that the attack on the power station could possibly be an act of domestic terrorism? I think it is domestic terrorism. 
like literally the de definition of domestic terrorism. I mean, we, we hear all of these things of, well, we're not sure if it's connected to the drag show. Well, we're not sure of this. We're not sure of that. We're not sure of this. And I agree with that. We're not sure really of anything, but I think that we don't necessarily need a direct answer and direct, um, uh, some sort of, uh, some sort of direct physical evidence to see what it had to do with, or if it had to do with a drag show or not. I think that one of the things that we can simply do is doing homework of our own as a community and as individuals. Um, when we think about the timeline, when we think about the attacks that, um, not were only directed towards me, which I think is very important to understand when it came to this whole situation, is that these attacks weren't just directed towards me. They were also directed towards people within the community. They were directed towards Sunrise Theater. They were directed toward the board members of Sunrise Theater, the owner of Sunrise Theater. They were also mm -hmm. directed towards local businesses that were sponsoring and, um, and supporting this event. Um, they were directed to the children of the business oh. owners that were sponsoring this oh. event. Um, this was directed to me in a very inappropriate way of sending me videos and sending me pictures of, um, you know, people who were murdered and people who were raped to um, paint a picture for me um, of what should happen to me people who were telling me that I should be raped, people who were calling out my rape when I was, you know, 14, 16 years old, um, calling that out, saying that there was a reason why I was raped and I should be raped again. People who were asking for me to be killed and trying to put my um, personal information out. So when you think about all of those things and when you really delve into the timeline of everything, um, I will let you be the judge of that. I'm never going to say, um, you know, for legal reasons, I'm never going to say what it is and what it isn't, but I will allow people to come up with that um, conclusion on their own based on them going ahead. And again, as I said before, um, using the wonderful world of Google. Wow, that is quite a lot. And thank you for sharing a lot of those personal things with us and uh, our viewers and our members and really just showing that there isn't a floor of how far somebody is going to go to pursue very fundamentalist and very scary ideas. And again, I, I think just speaking, it's, we're thrilled you are here and standing proud and standing tall. And if it were me, I don't think I would be. So uh, you have my sincerest appreciation and thanks and for all of your courage. So just really incredible stuff. I, I can't even imagine, wow. Um, so, Naomi, as we talked about in the introduction, you were the focal point of right-wing attacks um, and was picked up by local and national media. Here's a clip from a community event in support of you and the LGBTQ community uh, soon after the um, Pride event and the power fail failure. There were six people on stage, including Naomi Dick. She's the producer and drag artist uh, behind that show at the Sunrise Theater. She gave a really detailed timeline of what happened Saturday. Even at this hour, as you heard Elena mention, we don't know 100% for sure that this was the motivation behind someone firing at substations was to cut power to this drag show. But folks here say not only did this show receive threats in the lead up to it, but it's also part of a larger pattern of drag shows across the country being targeted they count more than 120 this year. So, you know, I spend a lot of time working on these types of topics, the attacks on drag events and the attacks on the trans community. And it really seems to me that the point of a lot of the attacks on drag queens and the trans community is to bully and frighten our community into submission. How did you find in your life a supportive community so that you aren't afraid and you can to these bullies and terrorists? Yeah, most definitely. Um, you know, I one thing that I felt to mention earlier is that when it came to this attack that happened in Southern Pines in Moore County, as a um, broader look at this, um, Moore County being a royal rural, rural area, sorry, I couldn't say that today, <laughs> but um, but being this area, you know, um, this was the largest domestic terrorist attack on substations that has happened in U.S. history. So this was not oh, wow. something that happened 
Um, you know, one day in a couple of days, people were without power and there were a couple of people without power, a very small region of people without power. We're talking about 45,000 homes. Those are homes. Those are not people that are included in those homes. As we know, this could be a, um, you know, a, one home could have, you know, up to five people in it, you know, or more. Um, so there were more people that were affected. And I think that's really important for us to realize in this moment and when thinking about this story is that, one, this is the largest domestic terrorist attack to happen to a substation. Um, and if there were more substations that were attacked that night, um, we're talking about a catastrophic um, amount of people being without power. But when it comes to specifically this, we're talking about 45,000 homes and two people that died because of their lack of access to health care at the time. We're talking about hospitals that were on generators. We're talking about nursing homes that were on generators. We're talking about pharmacies being closed so people didn't have health or access to health care. That's very important to also understand. Um, and to, to, your, to your question, me as a person of color, me as a person of color who is queer and um, an Afro Latinx person who um, happens to be a drag artist, you know, drag is not my identity. It is an expression. It is a self-expression or an extension of my self-expression. My identity is that I'm an Afro Latinx queer person. Um, it is, it is within me as a person of color um, that the moment that I wake up, it, I, I, I don't know what the day holds. The moment that I walk out of my door, you know, I live in a very gentrified neighborhood, um, you know, where I don't know if me walking out my door is going to be looked at as being a threat or something that is different. Um, I don't know if me driving down the street in my car is going to be looked at as being a threat. And so my point to that is, is that me as a person of color, but me as a person of color who is queer, being within a marginalized community that is it, that society is taught to hate, really, um, especially by, um, you know, Christian nationalists and things like this, when it comes to queerness, when it comes to blackness, when it comes to brownness, when it comes to indigenous people, society is taught to hate us. And so this is nothing new to me to have to put on my hat of fighting for a cause and fighting for my community and allowing my community's voice to be heard through representation and through visibility um, of myself, of my body, of my, of my intellect, of my knowledge. And so when it came to this Southern Pine situation, um, you know, we as drag artists, but in artists as, as artists as in general, we want to be recognized for our art, but I never thought in a million years that I would be recognized for my, um, my connection to a terrorist attack. And I never thought in a million years that in 2023 that I would truly and by the depths of my soul understand what my parents who were people of color, who were um, growing up in the South and in, in New York and having to deal with um, racial, you know, issues um, and having to, you know, drink out of water fountains that were specifically for black people and who mm -hmm. saw the KKK and who um, were, were who my grandmother, who was beaten by a police officer um, within an inch of her life because she was um, this beautiful Afro-Latino woman who was walking down the street and a white man um, wanted her phone, a, a white police officer wanted her phone number and wanted to um, sexually harass her and she pushed him away and he beat her with his club and left her in an alley. And this was back in the um, this was back in the early 50s. I never thought that I would truthfully and understand being a person of color in 2023 that I truthfully understood what it meant to be a part of a marginalized community and feel the hatred of just the color of my skin, but also my identity as a queer person. Do you think if you were a white artist, the reaction would have been as strong, or do you think um, the your identity as someone who is uh, a black and brown person who is Latinx. Do you think that played a, a role in the hatred that you saw? 
Yeah, 100. I And I, I'm glad you asked that question. So I think that um, for one, I think that just being a person of color just added on to the hatred. Um, we're talking about, again, white supremacists. We're talking about people who um, it had really nothing to do with me being a drag artist. What it had to do with is that you're just a racist. What it had to do with is that you just don't like people that look like you um, or think like you. So I think that both can exist. I think that you can hate queer people, but I think that you can also have a hatred for people of color. And I think that in this instance, it was just an added on or was added on for when it came to the hatred of me, that I was a person of color, that I was headlining a show. This was not just a headlining of a show when it comes to me doing shows. Um, drag is a business. And so you don't really see a lot of drag artists of color who are taking the initiative to host, produce, and 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 financially be there when it comes to a show because we're not allowed into those spaces still in 2023. So when we have, when you have an event that is a queer focused event, that is a pride focused event, and then right on the smack dab in the middle as the headliner of a show, you have my picture being a brown person, being an Afro Latino person who is also queer, I think it adds on to the hatred that um, was directed my way. So I don't think that necessarily um, if I was white, um, they, that the direction would have been much different when it comes to their hatred for queer people. But I think that being mm -hmm. a person of color just added on to that hatred. And to close out this discussion, so do you have a sense of where the investigation is going or what has not happened? Yeah, um, I'm also glad you asked that question. So yeah, there are investigative journalists that are working um, effortlessly when it comes to trying to figure out what happened and also just trying to figure out what's going on in Moore County in general. Um, unfortunately, I will have to say that um, San Jose Pride, um, the board members, Lauren Mathers, who is a great friend of mine, is trying so hard to fight for that representation to continue within that area. But unfortunately, the board members of Southern um, of San Hills Pride, not Lauren Mathers, but board members, um, have really pushed for there not to be any sort of drag event, for there not to be any sort of drag or representation when it comes to um, drag or transness in general, especially from a trans or trans person or a queer person of color, um, by shutting down um, the uh, drag shows that have um, that were scheduled to happen uh, later on in this year. So right now it's an unfortunate thing that's happening. I think it's also important to remember that a lot of these anti-LGBTQ bills are really impacting youth mental health. And so when we have issues like this that are happening where a whole entire board is refusing to really allow for there to be any sort of representation when it comes to drag or the education of drag or the education of transness, it is not really um, within their right to say that it is protecting their community based off of a terrorist attack that happened, because in reality, what it's doing is it's impacting the youth within your area to let them see or to tell them, well, when things get bad, you know, what do we do? We just kind of silence ourselves and go away. And so it is my job right now, working, trying my best to work with um, that area to continue that representation along with Lauren Mathers and um, to really try to see what resources we have to make sure that we bring that representation back. Well, let's take a quick pause and reintroduce, reintroduce our guest. We've got with us Naomi Dix, one of the most dynamic, versatile, boundary produ uh, push, uh, pushing drag artists in the country. And as we're learning, probably one of the most brave uh, drag artists in the country. And Naomi was hosting a drag show in Southern Pines in North Carolina. And then local fundamentalists began to go after her and members of the LGBT community, resulting into what could be a domestic terrorism attack. We're talking about how Naomi and uh, her allies in North Carolina are pushing back. And be sure to answer today's audience question, what the heck is wrong with fundamentalists that they actually think drag queens are a threat? 
Uh, so now we're going to move, you know, we've been talking about some very heavy topics. Uh, we're going to move into something a little bit more fun for everybody uh, for this next part of the show. So we are about to start off with some fashion advice for Christian nationalists. And I think we've got some really spectacular uh, examples. Naomi, you were awarded uh, Miss Gay Texas America in 2014, the first alternative at Miss uh, Gay America in 2019, and in 2023, you were awarded the most divine in 2016 and 2019. You are by far the most fabulous guest we have ever had on the show. So we hope you can give, uh, when Bruce uh, puts some folks on the screen, if you can give some fashion tips to uh, some of the country's leading Christian nationalists, because they could use it. So. Up uh, first, we have uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene in the uh, world-famous State of the Union outfit. What, what fashion advice would you give her? So I hate to do this, but unfortunately, some of those things are incorrect. I am not, um, I had nothing to do with Miss Texas. I do know Miss Texas very well. Um, but when it comes to fashion um, and when it comes to being fabulous, aside from me being a drag artist um, and the Latinx Barbie of the South, um, I am Miss Hispanidad 2017. I am runner up of some national pageants as well as walking New York Fashion Week in 2020 and also being um, featured in some uh, fashion magazines as well. Um, so I can definitely give some advice on some of these <laughs> things. And if you bring up that picture, I have some I have some interesting things to say about that. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that maybe she was keeping herself warm. I'm not really sure why. Um, I have been in that building before, and I must say it is not the coolest building um, as far as temperature goes, but it is definitely giving me 2003, like, J-Lo vibes. Um, and J-Lo, as we know, um, is a fashionista and has moved on from that. I am just uh, glad to see that Miss Marjorie did not get, in, get any of her crusty makeup on that beautiful <laughs> and hopefully fake and faux fur. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, Dad? Uh, so next up, we've got Ted Cruz famously uh, lurking his way back from Cancun. Uh, what advice do you have for this really, truly wonderful polo and jeans ensemble? Aside from it looking as though he came back from a country to where he may have purchased um, a sex worker. Um, that's what it's giving me. I have to say that I hope that he has a change of clothes in that very small um, carry-on bag that he has. And maybe just a suggestion, maybe not wearing a shirt tucked in. And if you do wear it tucked in, maybe pulling it up just a little bit so that it's not you know, right underneath your belly that looks like you're about 15 months pregnant, which no one should ever be 15 months pregnant. Fantastic. And the last candidate we have for uh, Naomi Dix's School of Fashion is uh, the representative from Florida, Matt Gates, uh, saying something that he thinks is probably very profound. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, he definitely looks like someone that would try to flirt with me. Um, and if he did, I would totally be here for it just so that I can get some more dirt and tea on him and then use it against him later on. Um, but I must say that he is the epitome and representation of whiteness um, for the lack of his lips not being there. Um, also this orange spray tan is definitely pretty fresh because it hasn't been able to set in yet. And I have an issue with the fact that his makeup artist did not understand that his face and his hands are two different ethnicities. Um, the suit is giving, I'm here for it. It is reading a little bit 2010, um, Trump, Trumpy and children. Um, he's kind of looking like one of maybe Trump's children. His hair is a little crusty, which I would definitely not want to run my hands through it. Um, and also, I would suggest maybe drinking a little bit more water so that your tongue was not so white and dry. <laughs> Fantastic. And mental note, your face and your hand should be roughly the same color. I mean, they should yeah. be, unless you're a dream, but like, you know, whatever. <laughs> and maybe he is a drag queen. I would be here for it. Do it. 
All right, so we are now going to go to questions from our audience. Uh, we are refreshing very briefly. Uh, so our first question uh, comes from Dan. It says, uh, what is religion's connection to this issue? And, you know, I'm happy to take this. If either of you want to take this, I we can go in really any direction y'all want. Okay, yeah, so I can I can take this question. Uh, for our viewers who don't know, I'm our Equal Justice Works fellow and my project focuses on the intersection of LGBT issues and state church separation. So this is really like my very specific wheelhouse. Uh, and so I think, and you know, y'all can jump in as I'm talking, uh, but I think really one of the biggest issues here is that, particularly for Christian nationalists, this is all about enforcing a very specific view of gender and body roles. You know, we talk about drag, in, at least here at FFRF, in the context of trans issues because we see that even though plenty of cisgender people are drag performers, Christian nationalists do not make that distinction. They do not know the difference and they do not care to know the difference. What they are concerned about is a very specific understanding of how people should present their gender and how people should behave. And drag as an art form, especially as it gains more prominence, really challenges those you know, conceptions of dress and gender. And the idea that we can celebrate and have a really expansive view of gender threatens that dominance that they are trying so hard to push. I think that's why you see a very similar thread with anti-trans law that we see being you know, written by groups like uh, Alliance Defending Freedom, who also write a lot of these drag bands. Uh, these Christian nationalist groups are very much trying to hone gender and gender identity and expression into a very, very specific box that aligns with their understanding of their religion. Yeah, I think that was wonderfully put. Um, and I think that that directly answered that question. So I have nothing but to say that I echo exactly what you said. All right, so our next question is from Terry, uh, who asks, how can I stand up to Christian nationalists who have taken drag performances out of context? Is there any oh. way to directly counter these adult entertainment claims? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I always tell people, um, you know, when it comes to this is there, there's so much, and I know I keep saying this, but I, I don't want I don't want this to go unnoticed, is that it's so important for us right now to really do our homework. I mean, just to make sure that our messaging is united and to make sure that our messaging is consistent with each other. Um, I will say that when it comes to the right, um, they have no problem when it comes to making sure, they have a really strong message, I should say. And the reason for that is because when you are a part of a cult, um, then it is easy for you to believe in one thing because you have one person telling you something. And so that message is pretty clear across the board. We as the left and we as, as um, you know, progressives, we are so diverse when it comes to what we accept and things and so diverse when it comes to things that we are education and and the understanding of certain things. And so sometimes our message can be a little bit all over the place. But at the end of the day, um, we can still unite on the same messaging. So right now, making sure that your message is super clear, making sure that you are not taking your information necessarily from news um, necessarily from media when it comes to the LGBTQIA plus community, when it comes to the drag community and when it comes to the trans community, but actually delving in to that homework, looking and reading articles. There are amazing articles that the New York Times um, has written. There are amazing articles that um, New York um, uh, uh, media stations have written on. Um, and so those are those are the things that you need to look for. And simply also just asking um, your queer um, your, your queer community leaders, asking them what it is that you should say. I mean, don't sleep on us. Don't sleep on um, your council members who are queer or your council members who are allies to the community. They have an understanding of what these laws mean. They have an understanding of what these laws that are being pushed um, when it comes to the anti-LGBTQIA uh, bills, they have an understanding of that. So making sure that you, you're doing your homework and also 
just to end this, visibility is so important when it comes to standing up to those who are trying to push a narrative about uh, the queer community and the drag community. Just being visible, going to your queer events, supporting the, those queer events, because by being visible, you're allowing people to see that we are not the issue. The issue is, is this fake narrative that they are trying to push. Thank you so much for that answer. I think it's really, really helpful. I think especially engaging in your local queer community is incredibly important. So we have one last question uh, from our audience members uh, from Shannon, who asks, I have heard of many similar situations all around the USA. Where does the sense of entitlement that leads people to speak out against drag come from? Is it new or has social media just amplified it? Most definitely. So I actually talked about this um, with another interview that I had done um, about a week ago. This is nothing new. This has been around for a long time. When we saw the whole Trump era kind of come up, uh, so we had so many people who were so confused about, you know, where were these racist people coming from? Where were these, um, you know, um, people who just uh, hate queer people coming from? Where were these people who hate anyone that is outside of the white race? Where is this coming from? Where is this hatred coming from? And what I always used to say to that is the majority of the people who were asking that question were white themselves, whether they were, um, you know, uh, progressives or um, independents or people who were on the left. These were majority white people who benefited from white privilege. Um, we as people of color have never um, had a misunderstanding of the racist tendencies within our country, which is America. We are very, very aware that racism still exists and is a very uh, prominent issue within um, within our country. Um, but it wasn't until Trump and the Trump era kind of came around that we started to see that just like we as queer people or as trans people or as allies, when we have representation, it's easier for us to be able to speak out. It's easier for us to feel that we have a voice to be able to speak out. So the same way that we have that representation, you have to understand that when it came to white supremacists, when it came to white supremacist group, with groups, when it came to fascists, they for a long time were kind of hidden because they didn't see that representation and that representation that had a seat at the table with so much power as the president would have. And so when you have someone like Donald Trump, who is the most powerful person in the world, um, as the person who is representing you and the community that you want to be a part of, which is, you know, um, nationalists and white supremacists and, and fascists, when you have that representation, then it is easier for you to take that um, information and to take that representation and feel better about um, speaking out about the hatred that you have for anyone outside of your race or anyone outside um, of how you think as a person. And so I think that's why we started to see such um, audible and visible hate that has been happening, whether it's with the queer community, whether it's with the black, brown, indigenous community, or whether it's with the trans community, we have seen that hate even more so now. And media and social media has not helped that because it has really pushed into allowing these groups to have um, certain media groups that they belong to that are um, very, very um, almost like silent, um, secret, you know, social media groups for them to be able to speak out or even public media platforms. Because again, as we've always seen, whether it's with this or whether it's with cyberbullying, if you're behind a computer and no one knows who you are, then it's easier for you to have a voice. But those are the people that we need to be concerned about because those are the people that will end up physically harming people, just like we saw with the substations in, um, in Southern Pines. Thank you so much for joining us, Naomi. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, we usually only have one Ask an Atheist a week, but since the Supreme Court is wrapping up its session with a flurry of rulings, we are going to have a very special Ask an Atheist tomorrow, June 29th at 2 p.m. Central Time. Join Liz Cavell and Patrick Elliott as they go into detail on the good, the bad, and the ugly rulings of the 2023 Supreme Court term. 
And don't miss Free Thought Radio this week. And Lori and Dan's guests will be uh, will be really uh, dynamic. And you can find out how to hear Free Thought Radio at FFRF slash radio. And if you want more information about the FFRF, about the Information Foundation, check out our website at FFRF.org. To remember already, uh, thank you. If not, please join us. And we'll see you well uh, tomorrow on uh, Ask an Atheist.